Welcome back to the Sports Hot Seat. Last week we had Delano DeShields and Marquise Grissom in part one of this two-part series, and they're back once again, Mitch Garber with Mitch Melnick and Delano and Marquise. We left off last week talking about racism in Georgia, where Marquise Grissom grew up, and it brings up the question as to whether or not racism exists today in Major League Baseball. You guys are sort of separated a little bit from the rest of the population. You're the ones that everyone idolizes. You don't fall into the general population. Do you still feel any racism when people look at you, talk to you, treat you? Marquise? Um, I don't want people coming up to me and shaking my hand and patting me on the back, you know, because I'm a baseball player and because, you know, I'm making money. But if I was the ordinary black person on the street, I know it would be different. I know that for a fact. And that's the only thing I could say that I don't like about, you know, that situation. Bob? That's it. You hit it on the head. I mean, you, you, you know that you have people to come up to you, shake your hand, look at you just, like just this. Just because you play Major League Baseball. And they turn around and call blacks niggers the next minute. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it was it Reggie Sanders not very long ago out in the outfield was, uh, was hurled with uh, racial taunts by, I don't want to get the city wrong, blast the city, but I, I think it was Candlestick Park in San Francisco. The fans out in the bleachers were giving it to him the whole game. Mm -hmm. anyway, at some point, you guys have heard that. Do you sometimes just want to like grab people by the neck and shake them or throw them like, up against the wall? I mean, how do you how do you keep deflecting stuff like that? Well, you can't you can't get physical. I mean, not unless no, I they. Mean, I, you know, you feel like doing it. Not that you'd actually do it, but you feel like doing it. Of course, you get angry, but I mean, you know, you have to be uh, you have to be smart too and a little mature about it. I mean, you know, uh, the racism's mm -hmm. there. It's, it's always been there, but I'm not I'm not looking for a physical confrontation, not let somebody put their hands on me, you know, then we, we got to do what we got to do. Not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, you know. But how do you learn, I mean, do you learn to eventually deflect stuff like that away and say, so what else is new? Or yeah. yeah, I'll take the attitude if, if it's not in front of me or like me and you sitting here talking and, you know, after that, that's it. You know, they, they can holler from the stands from a distance or whatever. You know, that's something that I can't control. But if we're sitting right here talking, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be, you know, pretty much different. The, the fans in Montreal, for example, they see Marquise Grissom, number nine, the center fielder with all that talent. They see Delino, number four, the second baseman with all his talent. What would you like the fans in Montreal to know about you that they can't possibly know by just watching you from 400 feet away? I, I want the fans to appreciate, you know, me going out there every day and playing, and and I just want them to to appreciate my work. Two know? hits a day, you told me. That's what I aim for. I don't mean I'm gonna get two hits. No, but, but that's you know, that's your job. Go out and try to get two hits a day. Every day. Bob, what would you like the fans to know about you? The ones that I mean, they clap for you, they cheer for you, they love you, but yeah. they don't know you. Uh, just that, you know, I'm true. You know, I try to be uh, try to be myself. And what you see is really what you get. I mean, I'm, I'm just me out there. You guys, either of you think you're intimidating figures um, at all? The media have jumped on each of you at different times, more on you than, uh, than on Marquise. Did you, do you feel you're at all intimidating? Do you feel that? Uh... I don't think, I just think if people are scared of, of reality, then they might be a little intimidated by me, you know, because I try to be as real as possible. You like the media? Guys come in the no. room after every game? No. The only reason I don't like the media is because these people can say anything basically about us and uh, we have no way of retaliating. You're right here? Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying a lot of these people, I mean, a lot of reporters that I see that write about guys being on drugs or having these problems, they got the same problems. They got the exact same problems. And uh, you just don't, they don't get exposed like they expose other people. Grip? No, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't pay too much attention to the media. I tell them what I have to say, you know, and tell them the truth. And that's that. But, you know, like he said, they put things in the paper. They can turn the whole story around and, and make it something that it isn't. So that's the only, you know, negative thing that I don't like about it. But, you know, they don't bother me. They have a job to do. I understand that. And they have a, a family. I have a, try to make a living, too. So I just take it as, you know, part of my being in the big leagues or whatever. I'll steal one of Melnick's questions. He asks it all the time. Do you read what's written about you? I don't even read the paper too much. You know, that, that keep my, keeps my mind free. 
from worrying about what people said or what he said in the paper, what I said in the paper, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm the same way. I don't run out and get the newspaper, you know, or nothing, but if I happen to see one laying around, I check it out, see what they're saying. If you go five for five and uh, hit two home runs, you go check out the paper? Sometimes I do, sometimes You guys I watch I yourself know. on TV? Your I, try to, I try to watch myself on TV, just for the simple fact that you can learn a lot by mm -hmm. watching yourself. You can see different things that you're doing, and that's basically why I like to watch it. Here's a steal of home on a butt. Was this a busted squeeze? Yep. And yeah. Moise is up at the plate, I think, that. That was a, that was a great play. <laughs> yeah, we, we're going to try to shake something this year. What do we have him on there for? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is Pittsburgh. I think this is the game at Pittsburgh last year. Uh, it was on ESPN. It was in the middle of a pennant race, and you did everything that night. Right? Is, that, is that your best night? Yeah, had to be. <laughs> I don't think any player can do too much of anything else. You know, that's just one of those nights where I felt good and everything went my way. That made the last out. We saw you get a curtain call out there. You come out and tip your hat. Um, we'll never know that feeling. 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people. Not that many. You. Not that many. <laughs> not Olympic Stadium. More like 10, 15,000. That bother you? Sometimes. But, you know, they're watching the Canadians right now. I understand, you know, hockey first up here. But you've been there. I mean, there was a, that great Sunday afternoon last year when you guys were But it's a not run. a consistent thing. That's what I'm saying. You know, we go to other ballparks in the States. There's, a, there's 30 grand there every night, you know. I mean, don't matter who's there, they're just there. Used to be like that here. Yeah. You guys were in diapers, I think. Yeah, but it used probably. to be like that. Were the, were the Expos winning? Yeah, they, they came close every year, but they just couldn't get over the hump. Is, is, Mon is Montreal the city that you happen to work in? Or is it a city you really want to work in? <clears throat> you want to happen to work in? Yeah, because you don't have a choice. I mean, you get drafted and you go play wherever you get drafted. But now that you're here, do you like working here or you just, this is where you are? And that's it. That's the way I see it. This is where I am. This is my job I'm in the big leagues. The only thing I don't like about Montreal is the taxes. That's it? Yeah. That's Bob. because he's making so much more now. Listen, I, always, uh, I didn't like when I was making you. the minimum. <laughs> Marquise, I always tell my clients, if you're paying a lot of taxes, you're doing all right. Yeah, but I mean, well, we get penalized, so to speak, for playing up here. That's that's what he's saying, you know. I mean, a guy making our same salary playing for the Phillies, he's going to bring home more money. Not saying, you know, we make plenty of money. I thank God every day for the money that I'm making. <laughs> but that's just an example, you know. There's a, there's a, a I don't know which which Delino was that from last year. Which stage was that? I you got I'm, little, I'm go, smiling, man. You're <laughs> smiling. There so, you go. Uh, you must be all right. It's trick photography. <laughs> <laughs> My wife uh, saw you somewhere around the batting cage in some pregame interview or something, and you were smiling. And she says, what a great smile. How come he doesn't do that more often? I just, you know, I got to have something to smile about, really. I'm not just going to walk around just, e -e -e -e, you know what I mean? <laughs> that ain't him. He's just fake. About. Yeah. He'd be faking if he did. <laughs> a lot of people don't know you're a pretty funny guy. I think people think you're a pretty quiet guy. I am. Are you shy? Not no more. I used to be. I, I used to be, when I come on a show like this, I used to be nervous, you know. Yeah. And on the radio, I used to be nervous, but now it's like. That's because he sees. Nah, just I do it. it. That's, <laughs> that's why we got Bop in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't want some frozen center fielder sitting nah, here like. <laughs> nah. Them days are over. You know, everybody was like that. I Next think, time we'll have you, know, you alone. When they first came up, you know, all players, athletes, entertainers, you know, when they first, you know, been on, being on TV and everything. You was nervous when you first did an interview, weren't you? Absolutely. Okay. First pleaded a trial. Okay. Walked down the aisle. <laughs> <laughs> it rhymes, you were nervous it? at your wedding? Yeah, of course I was. You? Not at all. Me either. I was nervous she'd leave before it got started. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you should know by then. Yeah, yeah well. <laughs> well. Anyway, really? my gut feeling was right. All right, so uh, let's, get, let's finish this up with baseball talk. Do you mind? Baseball and just baseball. I know what you're getting ready to talk about. All right. Go well, ahead. it's unfortunate because we dealt with this uh, uh, in another show about the business of baseball. Uh, of all the things that were said, and we are going to get to the actual baseball as we see Delino in action uh, last season against the Phillies slamming one. When we, when we talk about the business of baseball and the arbitration process, of all the things that were said in that room, what was the one phrase, the one word, the one description that angered you the most? It wasn't, it wasn't just one 
scripture or whatever. It was just the, the point that the people that they had to to, to to use, you know, like my numbers, my stats, and to, to tell me how good I am. You know, can't, they can't tell me how good I am. I know what type of year I had and over some money. You know what I'm saying? And they don't, it didn't, have, it didn't have to be done the way that they did it. But it didn't bother me at all because I knew it was a business move and I knew they had to do what they had to do. They had to downgrade me as much as possible. They, they don't believe what they said. Good. You know, I think you should know, you probably do, that they don't believe what they said in that room. They don't really believe it to knock you down. I That's believe not that You believe that they believe that? Why shouldn't I? Do you know for sure whether they do? No, I know. So I don't know. This is what I'm trying to get at, what exactly was said. But that is done in every arbitration hearing, in every ball club, in every organization. And uh, they'll turn around, and if, they, if Dan Duquette wants to give a description of Marquise Grissom, he'll talk for the next five days about what a great ball player you are. I, could confi yeah. I can confidently tell you that they didn't mean it. And Bob's right when he says, do you know for a fact? The answer is no. But having been involved in so many negotiations, hey, the, the whole key is we got to walk in there and say, why we shouldn't pay Marquise this much? We want him, but we don't want to pay him anymore. It's a business. We'd rather pay him two than three. I understand that. Two and a half and three and a half. They can't possibly mean it. They know how good you are. They know who. I mean, if they think that of you, then they would be the only ones who would think that of you. You got to think. You got to realize that. Everyone else in the whole world of baseball, fans, media, and players included, mm -hmm. know that it's not true. But you said to Mitch just earlier. You said it didn't bother me at all. Now, if it didn't bother you at all. You know, then I'm lost at why we're talking about it because the whole premise was that it bothered you a lot. I'm here playing. You sure are. I'm happy. Did it bother you, Delano, that uh, that whole incident happened with Marquise? Yours was just settled before going to arbitration. And I remember sitting on this show saying, I hope they don't go to arbitration with either one because of that very reason. But after the arbitration, we sat here with Terry Hagan and Jeff Blair of the Montreal Gazette, and uh, I said, hey, Marquise has got to realize this is just this is business. This is nothing. He should just walk away from that hearing. And, and, and that'll be, that should be the end and of it. And I did. And you did. And I did. Yeah, but it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> nah. No, I mean, Every it's, time, still, it's still here. You know, it's it's going to stay in the back of my mind. You know, it's going to stay there. But the thing about it, you know, people keep bringing it up. It's dead in my in my. Okay, because you know, the only so. reason people keep bringing it up is people are a little concerned that uh, at some point when you have the opportunity to write your own ticket, that that will be a factor. That if they don't lock you up, for example, in a long-term deal, that uh, you'll say the closer you get to become eligible to test the market, mm -hmm. the more tempting it is for you, and your thought process will go back to that arbitration hearing and be say, like, why should I give them a break anyway? You're gonna be like, it's just business, fellas. You know, yeah. I, I was taught that you treat people the way you want to be treated, or you treat people how they treat you, or whatever. You know. I'll tell you, I'll say something very unpopular with the Montreal Expos, and that is if they don't lock these two guys up in the long term, they deserve to lose them both. Say well, the same a, thing for, well, for Larry Walker, uh, Moises. Moises Alou. They don't lock them up Wetland, long term, Rojas. they deserve to lose them all. You guys know what the Cleveland Indians are doing? Now, that was a good gesture. I mean, personally speaking, that, was, that showed me that they're really committed to those guys and, and trying to do something good in that city. But, you know. It wouldn't make you play any better, though. No, but it's just... The idea of, of just keeping your ball club together, and that doesn't happen every. I mean, a lot now in uh, in sports, you know, guys are switching teams and this that, and the other. And, and I would like to see us keep our team together. And that's that's what it's all about. For the benefit of the fans who don't know, the Cleveland Indians have basically locked up the core of their talent, their young talent, for years with multi-year contracts, and a lot of people in. Uh, in, in fact, even members of the Players Association aren't thrilled about it because they feel they've given up some money for security. But when you get when you get into the millions, at what point does money stop mattering? I mean, what? I mean, do you have a figure in your head? Well, geez, uh, I think three million is enough, or four million, or six million, because you know how money can work. You know what greed is. You know what temptation is. Yeah. I think bonds showed that when you get up that high. You choose the city you want to be in. Pretty much, why not? I mean, you're talking about 13 million or 13.5 or 14 million. Then you start thinking about where you want to live and raise your kids. I think that's important too. Where, mm -hmm. where to live and raise your kids? Yeah. You're talking about? Yeah, at mm -hmm. some point, the money is not that important. You know, I mean, you make enough that you can walk away from the game and be fine. But it, like he said, you know, it's more about where you want to end your career, this, that, mm -hmm. and the other. You know.
But what about, the, you know, there are some athletes in every sport, Ricky Henderson in baseball, for example, and this is where fans have a hard time dealing with a lot of today's athletes who make a lot of money, is a guy will sign a contract and then find out what so-and-so on his team or so-and-so in, in the same position is making, and he thinks he deserves more, and after signing a contract for $3 million, which a lot of fans just cannot relate to, complains about it. I don't, I don't agree with that. I think if you sign, you know, you play for what you sign for. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what happened, you know. That's the market. That was the market at the time. You know, it, it changes every year. And he signed a, a three-year deal for whatever. I, I'm pretty much, I'm pretty much sure he felt that he was secure at that time. But the next year it changed. Do you, do you see fans getting angrier uh, a lot more quickly these days because of the money you guys make? Do you think that's a factor? That's the first thing they bring up. But I think, <clears throat> me, I think it's not the money I think is who's making the money no, I think I think what Mitch means is when a guy's making two three million a year he goes over for four you know your average fans gonna go three million dollars a year walk out of the stadium and, say, and go home and keep talking about it in the car three million dollars a year over for four this so, guy's a but, choker but once again like I said I don't think it's the money so well, what, do you mean? what do you mean just like I mean every every time I watch uh, the news or something and they talk about Barry Bonds you know, the $7 million man, this, that, and the other, but you don't hear that about Ryan Sandberg. And he's making Same thing. $6 million. So I think it's who's making the money and not the money necessarily. So there's a double standard at work here. Yes. Back into topic one. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's shift gears into topic three. Are you confident, in spite of what happened at the arbitration table, that basically this team, the Montreal Expos, will in the immediate future stay together? I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't mind staying here and playing here, but I don't know. The way things are going, you can get traded. Jose Canseco got traded. You know, Ruben Sierra, and it's, it's pretty much, it's gonna take a lot of loyalty and a lot of other things from the front office and to make those commitments to sign people to long-term deals, so. On my end, I'm not worried about it at all. I just want to continue to play and stay healthy. What about some of the other factors at work here? Management, the manager, coaching staff. Do you like what's happening? Yeah, we have, everything's falling into place. You know, as far as I'm concerned, we're, we're on the verge of being a, a really, really good ball club. So it's just a matter of keeping the guys here now. Dan Duquette has talked about uh, the Dallas Cowboys, about how young the Expos are. And uh, he said the Cowboys, the youngest team in the NFL, won the Super Bowl. And we have guys who are ready to lead, uh, who have been here a few years. The line of the Shields, Marquise Grissom, Larry Walker. Can you guys do it? Or would you prefer to have somebody else around who's been around for a while to, to lean on a little bit for guidance? I think we can hold our own. I think, I think we can hold our own. Yeah. Are, you, are you happy in that role, though? I mean, you got some young guys on this team. But we don't, you got we Mike don't, Lansing's two lockers away from you in the dressing room. But we don't look at ourselves like that. I mean, you know, we're, we're all on the same level pretty much. We don't look at myself as being the leader of the club or him being the leader or Larry or whatever. You know, we just, we're all 26, 27, 24. So we just go out there and do our thing. But you man. don't take the initiative to approach Lansing about stuff that you've experienced three years ago? that maybe you could help him out with a little bit. When you came up here, you were raw. Now he's raw. Someone must have helped you. Did anyone <coughs> on the Expos help you when you first got up here? Well, I had a Tim Raines, I had a Old Can, I had Wallace Johnson, Otis Nixon, you know, veterans. But you're prepared to be someone else's Reigns and Oil Can now? Yeah, if, but these guys are a lot younger than those guys but, were but when they the, came but up. But they're the Reigns and Oil Can of this team. They're the experienced but ball a younger, players of this much team. Younger Larry versions. Walker, Marquise, Delano DeShields, and Dennis. Yeah. I'm going to go out there, I'm going to be myself. You know, I'm going to go out there and play my game and do what I've been doing. You know, if somebody wants to talk about something, I sit down and talk with you. But at the same time, you got to be a man, you know. <laughs> you got to be a man out there. What, do you guys have anything to learn still about baseball at the major league level? Plenty. Like what? Everything. You just never stop learning. As far as baseball is concerned, you, you, you go out there and you try to learn the pitchers and what the team's trying to do to you each and every time, each and every time because they, they're going to switch it up on you. You know, every time they figure out what you're hitting, then the next next game they they coming right at you. So you can never um, stop learning the game of baseball. I don't think.
Speaking of learning, you had Lou Brock at spring training, uh, giving you some tips, I guess, and just discussing <laughs> base stealing. I, I said to Lou Brock at spring training, I said... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's laughing already. You want to tell me what's so funny before I nah, finish the question? Go ahead, go All right. Ahead. <laughs> I, I just asked Lou Brock if Marquise asked him any questions that only a great base dealer would ask. And he just looked at me like this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> did you... Did, was it helpful to talk to Lou Brock? Yeah, very helpful. He, um, he got... He's, he's at a... He know base still, and he's and he's like he's so smart. He's up here, and he knows another level of base stealing, which we talked about. And me and him, neither one of us wanted to get into it. So it was like, no, nah, we'll just stick to what yeah, we're I'm doing, cool, and cool, <laughs> we'll stick to what I'm we're at. doing, and <laughs> maybe we'll get to that level, you know, next couple of Is years. Is he too or technical? You mean, from a technical standpoint? Uh, the theory. Yeah, the theory is kind of. Tough. It's power step he talks about memory nah not nah, it's, it's it's beyond that it's uh it's like physics yeah it's, it's up there <laughs> but i i don't want to discuss it cuz i'm gonna save it for you know later on in my career or something as far as base when you slow down <laughs> yeah as far yeah, as base dealing is concerned um would you consider if you had to compare your, one to the other you'd be the speed merchant you'd be like the sneaky base dealer you're sneaky you're mm -hmm. sneakier than than fast, if you had to compare yourself to Marquise. Would that be accurate? Well, he outruns the ball a lot of times, you know? <laughs> I look at him, and he, I'm like, man, he ain't get a good jump right there. So in the last four or five steps, he just outruns the ball, whereas I got to do everything right. <laughs> you know, I, can't, I can't not get a good jump and be safe, you know? If I don't get a good jump, I'm going to be out. You talked about, uh, in the last show, uh, uh, maturing a little bit. Did your problems with umpires, is that part of it? Because you're still getting... The, you know, I, the, one of my pet peeves in baseball is major league umpires. The, the old saying is 90% of the time they get the call right, and yet on the bang bang plays, you check the replay, I think 90% of the time they get the call wrong. As base stealers, I mean, you've both been victims of the ball maybe beating you guys there, but the tag not being applied in time. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you say anything without them getting back at you at some point? I mean, nope. Best yeah. thing to do is just he found take that out. call and go on back to the dugout. <laughs> There's no doubt in your mind, is there, that the umpires had it in for you that one year, that they were testing you, they were pushing you? <clears throat> I think, well, man, I don't think, I know, you know, but I had a lot to do with that too, you know. I'm not going to just point my finger and say it was all them, but uh, it was a little battle going on there, though. Mm -hmm. Do you talk to them at all anymore? Some of them. Do you but, talk to uh, opposing players? You get on first base, do you talk to the first baseman? Yeah. You too? Mm -hmm. He's not there fast enough. <laughs> all, all the teams. Long enough. Long enough. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Try not to be. Yeah. Do you got? Do you got a favorite? Uh, do you have a favorite ball player? Now, today. I do. My favorite player is Barry Bonds. In baseball. I mean, I think he's the Michael Jordan of of baseball. What What is what specifically about Bonds that you that impresses you the most? Well, it makes you shake your head when you watch him play. Because he, he, he just, he, he hit. He <laughs> delivers, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like Michael. Yeah. And now that he sets such high standards, you know, people expect him just to be out of this world every year. I mean, you don't win back-to-back -back MVPs by doing nothing. I mean, you know, this guy is a great ball player. Why do fans seem to hate Barry Bonds and love Michael Jordan? Well, I don't, I don't know. That's, you know, I have to take a survey or something. I don't know. You hear negative stuff about Bonds all the time. Well, Bonds has got this. He's he's certainly got an <clears throat> attitude, and he doesn't. Uh, he's 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 got a love-hate relationship with a lot of members of the media, certainly. Um, but I also think what Delano said earlier about Ryan Sandberg is that, that there is a double standard. They'll describe a black ball player a certain way. I think it was Reggie Jackson who said uh, uh, a black is is referred to as uh, as arrogant and a problem child, and a white guy is, uh, is aggressive and cocky, is how he put it. You guys uh, changing all that, both of you? I'm, I'm just going to be myself, you know. That's all mm -hmm. I can do. I'm not going to go out there and try to be something that I'm not, you know. I'm going to just be bop. Is the fact that uh, Felipe Alou um, is Dominican, is a minority uh, manager, uh, Don Baylor, Afro-American manager, is that a positive for you? Not, not for me. I mean, it's, we're represented well on the field, but, uh, 
you know, I'm looking more into owning a ball club maybe and, and just, you know, running the ball club, having, running the whole thing. You know, I, I think until that happens, you know, we're still going to just be treading water. Well, I asked you last week, do you think things are getting better? You said no. Do you not think that things are getting closer to um, black ownership in professional sports? Until that happens, it's not going to be better, right. you know, because... You, you want to own a ball club? Yeah. I want to see minorities owning the ball club, running the ball club, calling the shots, firing people, hiring people, trading people. That's what I want to see. Would you hire him? Oh, yeah. Yeah. As you, you got a job? <laughs> I got a you job. own the ball club. What would, what, what would Marquise be? GM. Yeah, hey, GM. I'm asking you. I'm asking him. <laughs> I'm telling you, GM. <laughs> no, I'd, 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 I'd give him a job where he could just sit on his butt and just sit back <laughs> and, and make a hundred grand. So you'd be a GM and you'd have to go to take some of your players to arbitration, say really nasty things about yeah, them, even I though sure you didn't would. mean it. I'll get them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick it to them. Nah, I you know what that. to say. Yes, I, you're right about that. Have you got this mapped out a little bit in your mind, like how how long you want to play and how long it'll take you to be in a position to accumulate that kind of money and what to own a ball club? Yeah, <laughs> fifty years at this yeah. present salary. Yeah, nah, I mean, well, what you would obviously wouldn't be the sole owner, right? But if you can get a group together and I like well, who's doing owner. it in the uh, NBA? NBA, you got me. They tried. Yeah. Walter Payton's trying to get a football. Walter Payton's trying to get a football team. Magic Johnson's one. Well, yeah. Magic Johnson, had he not uh, been HIV positive, I think was right on track to, to own a major league, uh, a National Basketball Association team. That was no question about it. Mm -hmm. um, it'll happen. But I think I think maybe what the line O means, I don't want to quote you, is it's too bad you have to be a pro athlete to make all that money to do it. Should be black lawyers, black businessmen from, from all oh, walks. There's, there's definitely uh, people in the community that have that kind of money, but I don't know, they're just not interested right now, I guess. Well, but that's the thing. We appreciate it. All right. That was great. Marquise Thanks Crystal, for coming in, guys. The Lion of the Shields. We'll be, no back. we'll be back next week on another edition of the Sports Hot Seat. This has been the second part of a two-part series with Marquise Grissom and the Lion of the Shields. Get out to the Olympic Stadium anytime you have a chance. Make sure the Expos are in town before you go out there, mind you. <laughs> it's fun. 93 is going to be a big year. These two guys are going to give you definitely your money's worth and a whole lot more. For Mitch Melnick, I'm Mitch Garber. We'll catch you next time on the Hot Seat.